Yeah. All right, everyone, let's get started. Um, it's my great honor to introduce Christina Chung for today's talk. Um, Christina is assistant professor at, uh, of informatics at IU Bloomington. And uh, um, she studies personal health informatics, personal informatics in the social and changing environment. Um, she's uh, graduated with a PhD from the UW HCDE program, Human Centered Design Engineering program. And she, her paper has won many, many awards in CHI, CACW, and Health Informatics Value. Um, with a short introduction, I do want to mention that on a personal note that I tried to recruit Christina as my PhD student many, many years ago. Uh, she didn't come, but she didn't come here. Um, but I've since then followed her success at UW and at Indiana. And I will read many of her papers and cited many of her papers. And uh, it's great to have her here to give this talk about um, Things happens uh, in her research trajectory that um, in the personal informatics field, and many of these are related to healthcare. Thanks, Sina, and this was really great introduction. And <laughs> um, so I'm, I have to be honest, I'm a little nervous. This is the first in-person talk I have for like many, many years, as you can mm -hmm. imagine. So it's so nice to see everyone here that, you know, not just looking at all the black squares you know, on the screen and um, seeing people like smiling at me and like nothing is like, so even just haven't started my talk, you know, I already feel rewarding. And for all the people that I've met and I'm going to meet um, in a bit, I'm very grateful that you have me here. Um, so, as Ina just talked about, um, so my research has been looking at kind of personal problematics, but also kind of starting to uh, look at kind of the social part of it, but also kind of thinking about, you know, all our lives are in like constant changing state and how do we actually design technology to think about all these aspects that are changing. Um, well, okay. So, so this is kind of my kind of high level statements of my goals of my research is how can we design first of technology uh, to support changing the social nature of everyday behavior and context. Um, kind of going through kind of different type of projects that I have done in the past and now I'm trying to explore ways in different contexts that we can kind of look at this kind of high level, high level goals in different aspects. Um, so I have done work in kind of looking at clinical care, patient provider collaboration, uh, work at kind of um, social media, workplace, what does that look like when you have workplace health program that support uh, personal tracking, what, is, or what does it mean? Uh, look at families, and since I moved to Indiana, starting to kind of look at kind of larger food systems and kind of community that are larger than you know, just individuals and families, what does that look like when we uh, design personal informatic systems? And for every personal informatic researcher, you always kind of encounter this question, like, how can we make machine does uh, help us to understand this data better? Is that always better? How do we think about this trade-off? So I'm going to kind of talk about a few parts. I cannot talk about all the things that uh, I've done. I would love to. And, Previously, um, a few minutes ago, I met with other grad students and they have uh, all great questions that I would love to be able to answer with my project. But with the time we have, I only have like, and I'll probably talk about a few projects, uh, but kind of kind of tell, tell you a little bit about how we explore these aspects in my uh, research work. Um, a lot of my work situate in kind of healthy eating and then food tracking. Because I think food is like a, such a complex problem. We don't have great work, uh, system to support that. Right now, a lot of the food tracking systems still focusing on mostly at least the commercial systems. In research work, we have been doing a lot better, but most of the commercial systems are still focused on weight loss, calorie tracking, things that are easy to track, but not necessarily representing the eating experience. So I'm trying to kind of look at kind of food uh, tracking in different aspects. Uh, so I'm glad this is post lunch because you know a lot of times I show a lot of food pictures and people just like get triggered and, and not hungry. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Um, so I'm going to kind of take it back a few years. Um, this was the project that I did as part of my dissertation work that we look at, you know, photo-based diaries. How do we use that to support patient-provider uh, com communication? This has uh, been a, a while from now, but I kind of want to tell you a little bit of this and how this led me to think about where we are. So, you know, even today, look at this um, kind of the diaries. These are pretty much still kind of the diary you will get from your doctors. If you go to doctor's office or dietitian, a lot of them still give you these little pamphlets or, you know, like little paper because they have a lot of flexibility for doctors or providers or experts to kind of highlight the, uh, things on them, cross out things and write things to in interact with you. Uh, the systems we have today, a lot of them uh, still are calorie based. They are very, they are better at helping you to keep track of things, but also kind of focus on the one type of tracking that often kind of trigger people or notch people to eat things that are easier to track, but maybe less healthy for you. For example, your homemade salad is very hard to track on this thing. You have to select every ingredient. Or like the sandwich I just had for lunch, I don't even remember what was in there. And then I have to figure out what's in there and to be able to track. So to make it easier, I might choose to be something simpler, right? Uh, years and years of HDI research, sorry, has shown that photo-based diaries has a lot of benefits. It's easier to track. It's more socially appropriate because everyone doing uh, Instagram, TikTok, you know, there's a lot of visual contents out there. Uh, it captures more context. People know how to, you know, remember what's going on in that settings better. Um, it also helps you to kind of see what are, why are you making the decision that you made? Why are you eating the things you made? Um, so help you to think about that. At the time when we did this study, um, there weren't a lot of photo-based systems for patient-provider collaboration. So we know this works for individuals. We didn't know at the time if it works for uh, contacts that require experts to review this data with you. So we uh, look at kind of two different populations that might need this kind of uh, interaction. They, they might be looking at behavior change strategies. They might be working with health coaches, nutritionists, uh, dietitians to achieve healthy eating goals. We also look at kind of people who have chronic conditions like irritable bowel syndromes who want to identify their triggers because they have acute symptoms. They work with kind of providers, uh, physicians, nurses, and dietitians, people who are more on the clinical side uh, than healthy eating uh, people. So we kind of want to know like in this context where people, both of these types of people need expert support, but also different kind of expert support. So if we could see kind of what's a common thing come out of this kind of work, uh, but also kind of nuances in supporting different populations. So as part of that work, I designed and developed this system called Footprint. Um, it's a mobile uh, app um, that's a photo-based diary. Um, I, so we ask patients or people with healthy eating goals to keep track of their food, take a picture of their food whenever they eat. Uh, we ask them about their eating contacts. Uh, we ask them to track their symptom. Uh, and then we uh, create a kind of a, a visual summary uh, to help them to see. So these are the type of food that has uh, people, what, what is it like moving on its own? Um, <laughs> people have no symptoms, uh, mild symptoms and, and, and severe symptoms. So you can see at least like a little bit of correlation of kind of what you have been eating when you have symptoms or not. And then we run a field study with people, two different population people, we ask them to come to kind of talk to us about their experience. We install the app on their phone and we kind of have them to collect data on their own, on their um, home. And then we have them come back to sit down with the provider to see kind of how they will use this system together. Um, so one of the things I was really surprised at the time is when we started the project, a lot of doctors and providers was we're very skeptical, right? They would say, you know, these things, these photos don't have calories, don't have ingredients, don't have nutrients, don't have portions. Uh, how do I use this data even for? Uh, but when we run this study, after running the study, a lot of providers actually, nutritionists actually are very excited that, that they think, you know, comparing to this um, calorie tracking app, like MyFitnessPal, they think they got more information uh, what their meals look like. They know, you know, 
what they were feeling when they ate the, how do they prepare for it? They think it's more useful than knowing, you know, how much fat or calories uh, in their food. We also noticed that people spent more time because they were able to kind of, people are really good at visuals, right? People are really are good at finding potential patterns so they can have like try the next step very quickly. So this is a participant who found out that they um, like garlic and onions with their triggers. So they, instead of kind of doing more elimination diets, that's what typical clinical procedures does. Um, they, what they started to talk about, you know, this, this participant was a, she, she claimed that she was a foodie. She really cared about how things taste. So instead of saying you cannot have garlic and onions for the rest of your life, they actually talk about some substitution. So things that can keep the flavor, um, like um, olive oil that infuses garlic, um, scallions, um, asafoida, things uh, that they can actually still keep the flavor and make them feel better about what they're eating. Um, this was one of the surprising results to us is for this uh, participants that um, they have been suffering from IBS for years. So they had they eliminate everything they think might have triggered them. So if you look at these photos, um, they eat very simple. There's the same banana, same yogurt, same granola, same coffee. That's all they eat. But they still feel like has to have symptoms all the time. You see these photos, like they show up in all the columns. So it's kind of like there's no uh, correlation in there. Uh, but the providers came in, they sit down, uh, look at this for like three minutes. And then she said, oh, it looks like all the pictures has a steering wheel in the back. Um, so they were saying um, this stress, you know, like the, the type of lifestyle you have might actually be the trigger. So it turns out this uh, participant was a social worker. So they had to visit clients all the time. So they always uh, ate on the go. Um, so it's not the coffee that she was drinking, it's not the yogurt. It might just be the you know, type of lifestyle that the stress, amount of stress that she had. So they actually talk about more uh, kind of stress management, giving them suggestions about things they can eat that's nutritious, but they can, they can eat on the, in the car and actually add a few things back to their diet. So that's something that was kind of very surprising. We didn't expect this while well seeing. Uh, we also see that people use photos as a good kind of action plan because they can model what's in the photos. Um, so these participants that they found like large portion of food was a trigger for them. So the dietitians uh, kind of reviewed it how with them, uh, talk about kind of, can you have small portion throughout the day, the type of job you do, uh, do you, uh, does, does it allow you to do that? Can you let look at this photo to see, oh, this might be a good example that's small portion nutritious and this other ones might have too much carb but maybe that's not good for you. So think about kind of strategies and they can just exactly modeling uh, this kind of effect going forward. So at the time we found out this is, there are actual opportunities for even like photos seems abstract kind of uh, medium to support healthy eating in the consultation session in provider settings. We also found a lot of interesting things that are about, not just about the food inside the ball, a, a plate. Um, it's about kind of the eating context around food that actually being surfaced uh, from photos, right? We know a dietitian, or if you sit down with a, a health expert, they do this a lot. They ask you a lot of questions. Like, when do you eat? What kind of type of job you do? You know, uh, where do you get your food? They ask a lot of contextual questions. But sometimes it's not easy. It requires a lot of this kind of back and forth answering, uh, questions and answering to get this information. But looking at photo, it makes it actually very easy to spot all this, uh, whether it's continuous or kind of exception context that show up in the photos. So going away from like this project, so I actually started, we actually started thinking this eating context is very interesting. But it's also kind of seems very hard to capture, right? Like if you think about all these question and answer session that your providers are doing with you, what should we actually capture? Uh, and we know there are a lot of ways to contact that you affect how you eat, right? If you are in a work meeting versus you are hanging out with your friends, they might decide what you eat. Like 
like I had a very good time sitting down with a grad student today. Um, do, did I actually remember what I was eating? Not necessarily, but I remember all this. And I eat the food that I eat because I want to be with you, right? And so how do we actually know what to capture and what is useful and how do we use this data for? So this actually uh, kind of motivates us um, to kind of look at other contexts where eating contexts plays an important role. And one of those contexts is um, families. So in two different projects that we started to look at kind of what does family context play a role in people's eating decision? How do people actually talk about uh, healthy eating? Because we know like eating is very important uh, for families, right? Like uh, there's a lot of rituals around eating, whether that's holiday uh, eating, whether that's making uh, food together, whether that's you know, Waffle Friday and like Taco Thursday, mm -hmm. right? So those things play a lot of important roles for families. But healthy eating is also a difficult conversation to have in families. If you have experience where your, your mom is calling you, like you're nagging, you know, why are you eating this crap? And, or like spawn your Instagram or like, you know, or like if you are trying to kind of uh, have a lot of this conversation with the family, you will know, it's not always easy. Uh, our, our app like doesn't really help us with that a lot. Like if you search like family, healthy eating, you still look at this kind of app where um, they look prettier, right? It's comparing to the, the apps that we had when we started doing follow-based diary, there's a lot of follow-based diary today. They look very pretty colorful, but they still, a lot of them still focusing on uh, numbers, calories, ingredients. Um, these are not the typical things that you want to talk about with your family members. So we kind of started to think about what are the actual things that people actually care and what are those things that actually motivate people to eat better or you know, stop them from eating better. Um, so in these two studies, we look at two different types of families. One of them, we look at family members who live in different households. So these are adult children and their um, older parents who live in different households. Uh, we chose this context because we think um, these people have their own agency to decide what they eat. But a lot of their belief of in eating, healthy eating, also come with kind of their shared experience as a family member. So that's an interesting kind of context to think about how that things play out uh, in making decisions and how that influence uh, their relationship and how the relationship influence their eating. So it, in this case, we look at 16 older parents and nine adult children. Uh, to, to talk about what they eat, uh, kind of what kind of experience they have when they share kind of eating experience, pre pre preparation practices. The other uh, work that we look at families with preteen, uh, so these are uh, children between nine to 14. So we chose this, uh, uh, this population because like these are the kind of developmental st stage where children start to have agency, start to think about, uh, decide what they want. Um, they care about, they have a lot of peer pressure from, you know, what they want to eat. They, they look at social media, you know, see the trending things they want to have, and then kind of start to making those decisions into their family meal times. And we also want to see kind of how people decide what to eat, how to prepare these meal practices inside the household as a family. So this study, we look at 18 nuclear families. Uh, these families have around two to seven people in their household. Um, like I said, two, these two studies, we look at slightly different, very similar, but slightly different things. One of them we look at uh, because their, their family, um, when they live in different households, they experience different kind of roles. Uh, like you move out of your family home, you start to become a meal preparator rather than a receiver. Um, so how does this roles and context influence um, how, they talk, how you talk about um, the, the eating and meal preparation? So in this study, we did individual interviews with each member. We asked them to take a photo of what they've been cooking, what they've been making, what they've been eating. And we have individual design session with them. Uh, with the families with uh, preteen children, uh, we really want to know how they, how the process of, of kind of making this meal time, uh, what the norms on this transition look like. So we had them do a family meal time activity. Um, this was during COVID, so like they 
did that together and then and, and, and shoot a video and send it to us. And then we had family together interview and then we do family design session overview over Zoom with them. So there are slightly different designs, slightly di looking at different two different things. But one thing that commonly kind of com keep coming out of these studies to us is that when context change, um, there's a lot of new roles and norms people are, are forming. They actually change a lot of how people eat, what they eat, and also how these decisions are being made. In the older adults uh, studies, uh, we saw that things like older children, uh, adoption and moving away is a big thing to the family. A lot of the older parents told us that um, they lost motivation when they become the only one who they have to cook for in the family. And there's actually that a lot of studies, especially in rural Indiana, they are saying like loneliness is one of its biggest, one of the biggest kind of determinator where people don't eat well. It goes hand in hand with food security uh, because people, uh, when they don't have motivation to eat, even if you send food to their home, they will just let it perish and not cook, that, that cook again. Um, so there's a lot of kind of initiative, like especially after, I don't know if we are after COVID, but like, you know, coming through to COVID, trying to bring back this social communal eating in a safe way so that to motivate people you know, to eat better. One of the motivation in these families uh, also is for new members in the family that uh, people start to kind of change what they think about healthy eating. They have different motivation. Um, a lot of grandparents will say like, I don't care about how I eat. I don't care about how my children eat. They are adults, but then there's a baby in the family. I don't want that baby to become a mac and cheese baby, right? <laughs> so, uh, and so they start to kind of trying to intervene, you know, in a good way, but it also create a lot of family tension, right? The parenting style and, you know, who is making decisions of what they eat. For children, as in both family actually, so this caregiving for extended family, when the older parents um, has health conditions, uh, all kinds of family become affected. They change some of the, uh, some of the teenager families told us that their dads is never home because they are eating with uh, their grandparents. And then so they'll just have girls night with their, their mom. And, and this affects how they think about eating a lot, how, 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 what is family meal time means to them, change a lot. Um, and then, of course, like with this age of children, coming of age is a big thing. Um, they started thinking about, oh, I want to be contributing to my family meal. Uh, parents will think about, I want to prepare my children before they go to college so they can cook for themselves. But there's also a lot of debating on, you know, should we let our children be just children? They just enjoy their life, not think about all these things. Should we, are we okay with their using knives or you know, fire and all these things? So there's a lot of tension around kind of what family members think is important. And like throughout this process, we also see a lot of creative ways people are using uh, when they kind of trying to create this new shared experience. One of the things that we see a lot, right? Like we have a lot of technology that already kind of trying to help us to create this kind of social, social process of food activities, right? During COVID, a lot of people are doing co-eating together, co-cooking together through Zoom. There are also a lot of the Ubicom research or kind of CI research looking at um, like shared um, kettle, shared um, like apron that share a little bit of a social cue so, so that you can feel like the, the presence, presence of cooking or you hear the sounds of someone's cooking through messages and stuff like that. Uh, but from what we learned, I think, I think having all these shared experiences are cool, but I think a lot of them um, families also told us like they really want to know kind of they really want to build this kind of meaning you know what is cooking means for this family in particular right are we what are we sharing that actually contribute uh, to us understand each other for example one of the people told us I want the participant told us that what it means about cooking together in the kitchen is that they're like constant balloting they're they're like you know all these noises people are making in the kitchen, they are like running into, into each other, all these like low grade kind of arguments uh, they are thinking. And it's really not really about the food itself. It's, it's really about, you know, this is the thing they do together. And, and so how do we actually like recreate this meaning 
when we are thinking about this technology. And I think there is something to say about not just about kind of create a presence or create about the share experience, but also kind of create this meaning back and adding that back to the technology design. Another thing I think um, was very interesting is we see a lot of over the pandemic that people are sending meal kit services to their family members to make sure they have great uh, good ingredients uh, to make sure they eat healthy. Uh, but if you look at the meal kit service today, like Blue Apron, the uh, healthy chef and something like that, still most of them are focusing on the utility and the convenience of uh, cooking. But we already see people are doing this uh, for the purpose of caring and connecting. So what are some of the opportunities for us to kind of create uh, kind of interactive experience or connection through this kind of service? I think it's something uh, some of our team are thinking about kind of leveraging uh, some of the services we already have in Indiana and then thinking about how do we actually make this uh, uh, enjoyable and then create a uh, kind of share meaning over that. So these are so some of the contexts we've been saying, you know, that's very interesting that we see different contexts people think about eating and, and, and sharing. But another thing I think always like the big question is, so how do we actually design technology to support this, right? Like we know these are important, these are things people care, but how do we actually do that? Um, I don't know if I have like all the answers here. I think it's something I want to know, but uh, one of the projects that uh, we are exploring this is through uh, kind of automatic food data analysis. So, um, here I specifically meant uh, automatic systems um, in a broad way that's like in a lot of ways that uh, automatic analysis has a lot of benefits for when people don't have enough resources with experts, they experts cannot be with you all the time. So like through kind of system guided reflective questions through context-based expert knowledge, it can be helpful, right? It can also kind of help you to develop questions internalizing the behavior. So there are a lot of opportunities that we will also see constant kind of tension around kind of trade-off between who uh, should be, what should be automated, who should be in the process, what are the trade-offs between these resource goals and the needs. So these are consistent kind of consistent tension we think when we think about automatic uh, systems. But like in, in a lot of places, these tensions kind of, if I kind of have to contextualize this a little bit, uh, one of the one of the projects that we uh, looking at right now is this. Uh, since I moved to Indiana, we started deploy food screen, which is the uh, mobile app uh, to um, pregnant women in Indiana. Uh, this is through a gestational diabetes uh, project that we are trying to see the lifestyle factors for them. Uh, I'm not going to go to details into this project, but just kind of some some facts that sh to show with you that why this has become an even serious problem uh, in that case is throughout the past four years, we have 40, more than 400 pregnant women enrolled in our study. Um, they uh, are required to check their food intake for four separate weeks throughout the year of their pregnancy. And with that, we have more than 12,000 food photos uh, entries in our system. And just by analyzing that and having someone to go through that with their every visit, um, it actually adds a lot of burden to our healthcare providers because it's not part of their routine, right? If you go to OBGI and they don't have the knowledge to do it, um, they will refer you to a dietitian, but you know it might not be covered by your insurance, and and they we don't have enough to actually uh, do that. And so this become a, a a constant question that I keep getting asked is like, can we have some ways to analyze this through computing system? technologies. And of course, this is thinking about all this tension we already uh, seen. What are the ways to, to do this? But if you look at the current uh, computer vision, um, in this particular case, because we're looking at food photos, um, most of the computer vision system today still focusing on uh, food recognition in single plate. So you look, you'll see a lot of like uh, this kind of the photo is uh, they will separate uh, food into little segments for photos and then try to determine what is in there. And then I don't think you can read this, but you will see some of them are just very wrong. 
uh, like the on the top left, you'll say it's a ball of sauce, uh, but you know that's not right. And that's because the computation re food recognition has a lot of limitation, right? There are things you cannot see. There are things that are very hard to see. And our food can be a thousand different combinations. Um, like your broccoli can be chopped, can be sliced, can be you know roasted, and then become smashed, and just they are all different, and it's impossible to recognize them all. Um, a lot of the current system also use so this very pretty photo of the training data, uh, and then you will see like all the things are pretty much separated, so because it's easy to recognize, um, and you know, and that's not your food, right? Like the food that you have never look at this. Um, and then so kind of to show you kind of extreme cases of this problem that we had a video that we made for a, a Kai workshop. If I can figure out how to drag this over. Yes. You know, this is a lot of work. You can just take a picture out of the bowl. I'm what you call a technophile. I love using mobile apps to optimize my life. Drink water now. Hey. <laughs> and another tells me to meditate when I'm about to get in stress. Meditate now. <laughs> Meditation complete. <laughs> Meditate now. Meditation. Meditate. Recently, my friend and I discovered a new app. It's so amazing. It helps you to lock the food. All you have to do right now is to just take a photo and the app literally tells you everything. Here we go. And the app says it's a banana, but it has 105 calories, 1.3 grams protein, and it's organic. It's from Brazil. Isn't it amazing? You know what? You're gonna have to separate every ingredient so the app would recognize it. Oh, hey, 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 the cheese. I'm not sure what I'm eating, but I trust the app. It gives me everything I need, so why not? It's 100 calories. And it says 100 calories as well. Hold up. This is not how computer vision-based dietary assessment should be. Dietary management requires more than an estimation of nutrients, portions, and calories. We need to understand why people want to eat healthier, what they need to achieve those goals, and how we can apply AI technologies to support them. Separating ingredients before taking a photo may seem silly, but that is because we scientists created recognition models that do not consider more diverse training data. As we move forward, we need to examine a more holistic approach to support individual health goals. Okay, now I have to figure out how to drag it back. <laughs> okay, and then I better just close it maybe. And then, closing <laughs> more things. Yeah, this is like, I cannot see my, it's like not updating on my screen here. There we go. Okay, good. Problem solved. Thanks for <laughs> helping. So yeah, so you know, as an example, these are the data we collected from our participants uh, in the gestational diabetes studies. You know, these foods like like the food on the to the left, we have 60% of food that we call them uh, mixed food. So they don't have a name. It's not it's not a Alfredo pasta, right? It's it doesn't have a, it's not like a I don't know like a, some fried rice, right? It's just a bunch of food that people put together, and these are the things that are very hard to recognize for using current kind of models. And things on the right, like we as a human, if you look at this picture, you know it's very clear that the cake has some icing on it. Mm -hmm. uh, but for computer vision, it could just look like a flop of white and blue things, right? And the, for, for human, even you can look at this place, this uh, uh, disposable place. So you are thinking uh, this probably it's a birthday party or something celebration, right? It's not an everyday food you're eating because you're not eating everyday food on a plastic plate every day, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are some things that our human are very good at, but our current computer vision models don't really think about this a lot. 
and you think about kind of all this context we are saying that that's important uh, to actually even for diagnosis for giving personalized uh, recommendations. And plus that if you look at the current dietary guidelines, like it's very obvious that we are kind of trying to move away for from kind of just calorie counting, but look at kind of patterns for a long time, looking at kind of how do we customize this for individual differences and looking at kind of the diversity of the food. That's not just about, you know, what's in your food, but also kind of the, the distribution of your food. So, you know, this is kind of help trigger us to think about if we were to design the next generation of community vision model, how can we do this better? And as we started kind of trying to explore these questions in different ways, one of the studies we've been doing is we try to, uh, we uh, ask dietitians what they would do. Uh, we we observe what they do when they actually were given a set of uh, photo uh, diaries. So we asked them, uh, or we invited eight dietitians to review these seven day photo diaries. They all look different. They all look pretty much like this. There's some stuff in there. They might not know what they are. Um, and we'll look at what they do. Uh, one thing that's very obvious for all of them when they started, no one actually was counting the calorie for each and every photo. They tried to look at the photo uh, as a whole. Um, they would tell us things like this quote, they're saying like, you know, this person might have a day, they eat ice cream, they may eat these candies, but really what's really important for them is to be able to see that a week at a time, they see multiple pictures mm -hmm. at a time, to understand how they ate, how they are, to see these patterns over time. But this is not how conservation system currently work, right? If you download those apps, it will give you recommendation for every photo that you are taking. And this is has different challenges of like when you look at single photo versus a series of photos. Uh, but I think that's something to say in how we actually think about all these people's progression of their, their eating behavior over time. And another thing that we also was interested in is to looking at how, how what kind of visual features um, they were looking at, what they're using for, right? For variety, it's very straightforward that people will look at the color distribution of their photos and to see, you know, if they infer, they can infer like what kind of variety they're having. Like people say, there's not a lot of colors, so they don't think they have a lot of fruits and vegetables. They will say things like, oh, there's a, uh, a lot of things inside a plate. It's paper plate, a single use fork. <clears throat> so it might look like a party situation, not a sit down situation because just little food put in together. Um, <clears throat> they'll separate these photos into meals and snacks. So they're trying to understand what their eating look like on a time scale and what their food choices are between meals and snacks. <clears throat> so these are things they can see from the photos that visually they can tell. And so I think the question then became, how do we translate this into kind of a algorithm way to kind of think about, look at this progression, these changes in the context. We started uh, a, a, a few kind of different projects can look at this. I'm just gonna share one. Uh, one of them is we started to look at colors because we think, oh, that's very straightforward. Color distribution and variety is very easy to see. Turn out like what is the color is actually not a very uh, defined question. So if we look at all this red sauce pasta, for us, they all look red. For computers, there are also different colors in there, right? Like depending on the lighting, depending on the things you put in there, they look orange, brown, you know, different things. So you're trying to, when you are trying to categorize whether they are diverse or colorful, as we say, you actually have to think about color model a little different from just the pixel color. Okay. And another thing that's interesting that we found is what is colorful? Not just the computer cannot answer this question, for human is actually very interesting. There are a lot of studies showing like, basically let's do a test. Which one of this is more colorful to you? Raise your hand with the last one. Yeah. Raise your hand if it's the right one. Okay. So it's very interesting. I think a lot of people like on the large scale study, which is kind of opposite in the tier, people see when they say green, they think it's more colorful. Um, and then when people see red, they think it's less colorful. And we don't know why, but like, you know, this is just 
So when we are trying to think the colorful and then make it useful, translate the data, the results back to the human, uh, what they will use this information for, it's actually a different kind of set of challenges and, and kind of requirements to think about. Um, so even for things like it feels trivial and, uh, and, and easy to think about, you know, how do we do how do we actually determine the variety of the food intake and look at it over time? It turns out not as straightforward as we will think. And so trying to think through this problem for us is kind of an exercise of thinking through how do we actually tell, um, teach intelligent system, interactive technologies, what it means to look at the patterns, the context over time. And we don't have, we don't have a, system that's ready yet. We don't have the results yet, but um, I would love to hear more if people have think, thoughts about this and then thinking through how we can move this forward. So kind of going back to the very kind of high level question that uh, I had posed in the beginning, how can personal informatics technology be designed to support change in the social nature of everyday behavior and context? And I reflect on these questions when I was preparing for this talk. Uh, I was thinking about, I plot the kind of project that I've been doing on these skills uh, of social relationships and the type of changes we often experience. Um, we know like from you know, the ecological model um, that you know the social relationship can be easily categorized between from individual to close relation to community to social societal. And from other theories that look at kind of changes, transitions, and routine disruptions, um, this turns out to be the same scale that you can think about, you know, changes that happen to you, yourself, your family, uh, the community, and society, society. And then look at all this project that I've been doing. Uh, I feel like a lot of the, the work that I've been doing mostly focus on the relationships, like when we say social, mostly on the relationship side. Uh, we, we start kind of they look at a lot kind of more kind of cross for food systems and then what does it look like. But I, I, I think in the next few years, I want to kind of to be able to systematically look at all these different categories and kind of look at what kind of relationships and what kind of changes um, this actually affect people's um, be health behavior, maybe not just eating, but healthy behavior across. And what do we think about technology that can support help people to make sense of these changes, how help people to work with other people. Um, so yeah, so that's the talk I have today. Um, hopefully um, that gives you something to think and I would love to hear what you're thinking about right now. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll start off. Uh, I love your work as always. Um, one one question that I have that I've been thinking about also in, in uh, some of the work that we've been doing here is um, when when you're thinking about social context and when, when you're thinking about uh, tracking and, and social context like food, um, one of the first things that those of us who are in the personal informatics space would go is like, okay, we should try to be documenting, you know, aspects of these social experiences, right? Like who you ate with and, you know, that this was a meal that you ate at home and that this was, you know, the type of day and that sort of thing. Um, and I guess my question is like, do you think is in, in, in the spaces that, that you've been looking at this, do you think kind of drawing attention in that way to those experiences by doing that documentation is kind of helpful or hindering the kind of ways in which people are evoking meaning from those experiences, right? Because mm -hmm. that can kind of see it both ways. Yeah, that's a really good question. I also have been thinking about this um, a lot. I often think, or uh, I'm challenging myself, like is, is tracking documenting the right turn to, to even, you know, in this situation, right? I think, um, like I think some other terms may be capturing, maybe, maybe curating, you know, um, a, a more, more broader kind of, kind of terminology. And I don't even know what that means, but I just, I, I like, I wonder if there are ways that help us to think about the kind of traditional tracking in a different fashion, right? Like how do you actually capture experience, right? We, we get a snapshot of some, some sort of experience, but what does it look like 
you know, when you are sitting together with good friends and then, you know, like uh, eating or drinking and, you know, what are, the, what are the things, like, I think when we think about checking document, you, oftentimes then we take some quantifiable data through there and then kind of literally taking out of context, right? <laughs> so, so what are some of the other ways that can help us more be more creatively thinking through this um, phenomenon that we are trying to, to capture? And I don't have a great answer. And then I think part of that, what we are doing now is sort of also are, sometimes it's like constrained by what we think technology can do. And, and so I don't, I feel like, like I wanted to explore other kind of more creative ways that we can, we can do that. Uh, for example, I think, I think like sounds are so, so interesting, but it's very difficult to capture and then also very difficult to parse and then to make sense of it, right? To ask you to listen to an hour of, you know, CD, mm -hmm. No, it's, it might be very interesting, but it just takes you hours of time, right? So how do we actually make that an enjoyable experience? I think I think that that like some some creative ways and that yeah, and then it's like consumable ways, right? Like to to kind of consume those information. I think that's yeah, I don't know. I would love to take, talk more about this, just to think think about what other way we can experimenting with with these things. You know, I really enjoyed your talk, and um, I'm really curious about the graph that you showed and the end of the talk, and you're saying that you want to think about how to translate the artificial uh, strategies into algorithms, but like also considering like different perspectives, for example, like the individual relationship and blah, blah, blah. And I'm really curious about like how are you going to um, consider like um, the like taking the societal level into consideration when you're going to design technology, especially like when it comes to healthy eating. I feel like there's so many different like social policy norms. So like, how are you going to take this uh, dementia into consideration when it comes to design technology? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I don't know if I have like a definite answer to that. I think we started to do, to look at this a little bit because the pandemic unfortunately gave us a lot of uh, opportunity to look at this like everyone is impacted by the societal impact in some ways um mm -hmm. like you know if you go to the grocery stores and you can't find broccoli but in your apps you're telling you eat more broccoli it doesn't make sense right and and so like there's i think there, there are a lot of this uh kind of disruption that happens outside of the control that we don't as an individual, you might not be aware, or even if you are aware, just very little things that you can do about it. And so that's kind of actually, and then also like working with a lot of the people who study food systems uh, in Vienna and then looking at kind of the, uh, through kind of the lens of food security, uh, I think there's a lot of this kind of factor play into um, kind of why people eat what they eat uh, and why they are enjoying the things they enjoy or not. And of course, I think we also talk about uh, the cultural or like you know, norms that has been uh, in their communities. And so I don't know if I can capture all of them in one project. I feel like that's a maybe a lifelong <laughs> kind of pursuit, uh, but I want to explore different ways that we can actually help people to understand all these things that are affecting them, uh, not just because I don't want to eat healthy or not just because you know pointing fingers at people who are who don't have motivation to, uh, to eat healthy but uh, but but things to kind of how do we help people make sense things that are happening and how do we either kind of get people back on track or help them to adopt new priorities they have in, in life and then um and, and I think just like think about this from a more kind of systematic uh kind of approach um yeah so I don't know if I answer your question, but just because this also I'm also developing this kind of thoughts and ideas throughout. Yeah. But if you have you know thoughts, I'm happy to hear more about it. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like your answer also is like um also inspire what 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 I'm currently thinking about like designing technology for the broad like social and social culture context. So like yeah, just 
Yeah. I think a, a good question, good question is also what are these contexts, right? When we talk, when you say socioeconomic context, what are they? They it can be different in different situations, right? That or they matter in different ways. And so like being able to have maybe even like a better language to to talk about them will help us kind of to sort through this, not just like putting them in the in the, in the bucket. Uh, Amazing talk, thank you, thank you. Um, so I love the graph that you showed where you're showing these two kind of axes of social and then the social. So coming from a mental health perspective, I keep thinking back to your example about that social worker who was just reading on the goal. Um, so do you think that could be like another axis for the context of mood? Um, so for example, it could be like you're in a work meeting, but then it's also a stressful kind of a situation for you and the body you need to be or whatever. And it's something like that, um, and and like how that can be incorporated into your garden somehow. Because the the photo that you showed for your garden, because the computer vision test, they are tracking like nutrients and calories and things like that, and the context is in those cases. So I, I'm just curious as to like the mental health. Yeah, I definitely think all these axes are like pretty rough, right? Like they give like large categories of things. So you know what is actually in these social relationships, right? How they affect us, even with the same, you know, family members that might actually affect you different times of the, you know, and and so like the same societal events can have people different effects on people. And the same, like the same changes, right? Like, and like the relationship you have uh, with other people also, I think. So I think definitely, like you said there, other things within those big categories. And I think there are actually a lot of study kind of looking at those, you know, individually, uh, but maybe not like kind of, I feel like it's, like I, I kind of want to go back to all this literature that we've been reading for the past 10 years and then kind of thinking from this lens of, of like uh, kind of relationships and changes, like kind of maybe like, you know, kind of scope out, you know, what what are, what do we know about this, right? Because I think there are a lot of work that's actually looking at some of some part of this, right? If you're thinking about you did a cancer patient work, right? And then there are some some aspect of that that's kind of thing here, right? And you have the teenager um, mental health work, so there are some parts of that also we're seeing here. But but you have the different goal when you did a study. But like I want to kind of see maybe kind of like like a kind of taking a broader view of this and then see what we know as a community and what are the things that are, that are missing and then kind of uh, making make some ways to making like the the categories a little richer than what we have today. Uh, when you're building that um, health application, that kind of track of dietary habits and behaviors, um, you did it as part of your, your uh, presentation. I was curious how you know um, which features are going to are going to generate meaningful results in your students. Because on the onset, when you design the app, you kind of have to know like, which information you're going to collect from users. So I was curious about that part. Um, or is it more of an iterative a process where you go through trial and error and see those features and then you can filter out some and see some of it? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I didn't talk about this because that was like years and years of work that we work with providers and, and patients in that settings and kind of see um, like, you know, what it was useful, what, what has it then be doing? And we have studies that we published that providers are using text-based diaries in a very horrible way and that they don't even give people meaningful recommendations, but just that's the tool they have. And so I think that those work um, kind of the formative work and kind of contributing to the design of that app and i only talk about the, the, the app um, because of time but but yeah so that it definitely uh, requires a lot of uh, work uh, before you we can actually design something that's useful all right so it's straight um so let's thank our speaker for excellent talk.
And I would encourage you guys to stay around. Um, we have food and drink, and we can continue this conversation. I know many of you are shy. I have a question. You want to talk to her? Um, stay around, and we can have more conversation. Oh, yes. Right. I'm excited to explore, like, um,